Hello and welcome to today's episode of Stand Up. It's the Friday show and I have two great guests joining me today. Christian Finnegan is back for another wonderful visit. And for the first time on the podcast, I'd interviewed him a few times back at SiriusXM, is writer at large for New York Times Magazine, contributing writer for National Geographic Magazine, and the author of several books, including the New York Times bestseller Dead Certain, the presidency of George W. Bush, as well as The Start of War, How the Bush Administration Took America into Iraq. Great books. His new book is called Weapons of Mass Delusion, When the Republican Party Lost Its Mind. I can't put this book down. I think you're really going to like it. You're going to love uh, both my conversations, I hope. That's why you're here. If you don't like them, if there are things you don't like about me, the conversations, or the guests, always open to your feedback. We had a great, thoughtful discussion at last night's Subscriber Hangout, which we do pretty much every Thursday night. A great time, lots of fun, some debate, some discussion, some argument about some things, which was fun and thoughtful, and everybody, I think, got heard. And we would love to have you join us for feedback on that, to hang out anytime. you got to sign up to be a subscriber. I can't do this show without your subscription, so if you haven't, sign up now. Stand up with Pete.com, Patreon.com, slash Pete Dominic. Okay, not much preamble on the Friday shows. Usually, and today is no exception, so let's get right to my guest. Like I said, Christian Finnegan, awesome as always. He is coming up. You love him. I love him, and I think you're going to love today's conversation. But first, it's the author of Weapons of Mass Dilution, the New York Times bestselling writer, Robert Draper, joining me right now. I've been watching all your interviews, and you haven't lost any any hair covering Republicans. Your hair looks <laughs> amazing, sir. You look great. Yeah, great to see you. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much. I mean, I'm not sure what to say about my soul, but I'm glad to know that my hair still looks okay. Let's just be clear. I think you know that, that you have great hair. I think you know that, right? You don't take it for granted. I, please tell me. I know that I have hair, and in my <laughs> stage of advancing decrepitude, that counts for something. You've done so much in your career. You've covered so many people, written uh, several books. I just thought it was interesting to to see this new book come out when it comes out. Um, and it's so relevant and so timely. But you wrote a book about the Tea Party back in 2010. And right. if we wanted to have bookends, it seems like these would be good places to, to start. What do you think? Yeah, sure. No, it's I mean, yeah, not for nothing did I have the Tea Party book in mind when I was doing this one, Pete. I, um, the, you know, I had essentially embedded myself with those 87 Republican freshmen uh, when they uh, came to Washington in early 2011. But I have to say that um, while that was an interesting moment for the Republican Party, I would not say that it was of lasting historical significance like the moment we're in now. You know, this, this new book really is about a snapshot in time, an 18-month snapshot that begins on January the 6th, uh, more or less to the present. And obviously, after the cataclysm that was January the 6th, you know, the, the I think most reasonable people would have thought, well, OK, this is bad. The Republican Party um, has a lot to answer for here. Uh, surely it will do what it can to purge itself of the unsavory elements that gave rise to the insurrection. And as we know, Pete, that's not what happened at all. And instead, the doubling down of the of the MAGA tribe and the the delusional power of all of these lies that tens of millions of people believe in is really, you know, put um, put us in, you know, a, a near constitutional crisis. And and so is far more, um, you know, far more important, I think, to study than, um, you know, 87 dudes who showed up to Washington thinking they could change the place. Uh, well said. So you had really interesting access, as you always do, Draper. And <laughs> you talked to so many people here. So just list some of the people you talked to and, and how you talk to them. And you can get into anything you want. But I mean, at one point, you're like, at my dinner with Green. I'm like, <laughs> he had dinner with Marjorie Taylor Green, And he was honest about what his book was about. And the word delusions was going to be on it, maybe with her face. Who did you talk to and, and where and how did you get this access? Sure. I mean, I've look, I've been covering Republicans and conservative politics for, you know, well over two decades. And so, so that was not so surprising to me that I was able to talk to a lot of rank and file Republicans in the House and the Senate and elsewhere. I think that, that you know, was a far greater surprise. And by the way, far from an overnight proposition, 
was getting Marjorie Taylor Greene, the aforementioned uh, fresh, freshman congresswoman from Georgia, to speak to me. Since Greene, in a lot of ways, represents what the MAGA tribe has become, people who, who are so enamored of Trump and so correspondingly loathing of those people who they believe are enemies of Trump, including the mainstream media, that it's an article of faith that they do everything they can to avoid us. It took a year for me to sit down with Green. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time going to her district, of um, uh, going to her public events, and then finally of talking to her aides privately. And over time, they came to, you know, um, uh, to, to think that it'd be worth uh, their boss's while to sit down and talk to me off the record. That's what led to a succession of on the record interviews. And I think it was kind of surprising for her, Pete, because, you know, I'm, um, I've got a Southern accent like her. I don't appear to emit sulfur fumes, you know, and, and uh, I, I know, you know, I know what Republicans are like. I'm from, you know, a very conservative community myself. And I think that she had to cross a kind of psychological Rubicon, you know, before she realized, you know, wow, this one at least appears to be a human being, you know, and, and maybe worth my talking to. And yet. You also talk about how difficult access, even for you, has become. And I think it's really important to talk about what that means, because right. we'll, we'll get obviously into what you learn from her and others. I love the chapter about Kevin McCarthy, a lot about Kevin McCarthy, which is just so important and interesting. But what's what's changing? Like if, you know, if she doesn't talk to you or plenty of other people in kind of your world, what does that mean? Well, sure. I mean, you know, one thing that's happened over time, and this is true across the ideological spectrum, is that we all can find the news that we want to get. And so, you know, for those of us who are looking to have our biases confirmed, there is an outlet for it on the left and there is a rash of those on the right. Uh, the difference is crucial, by the way, between them. Then this is where the both sides is um, I would you know, pull away from. And that's that uh, the leftmost information outlets are not deliberately pushing out just absolutely delusional lies. And uh, so, but but a Marjorie Taylor Greene has come up in that kind of information bubble, and that's all she knows. Um, and, uh, and meanwhile, she believes that uh, her beloved president, Donald Trump, was uh, defamed by the mainstream media in the so-called Russia collusion hoax. And, and that gave rise not only to an antipathy towards members of the media like myself, but uh, to them embracing alternative information sources such as the QAnon conspiracy theory, for example. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's it, it has reached a point where reporters like me are, are um, I mean, really have to fight tooth and nail to get um, a lot of these MAGA Republicans to talk to us. And it's it's kind of paradoxical because Trump never stopped talking to the mainstream media as much as he you know, would threaten us, as much as he tried to demean us. I mean, he had, you know, my colleague Maggie Haberman, you know, in Mar-a-Lago and in the White House all the time and, and um, uh, friends of mine at The Washington Post as well. So yeah. uh, so Trump never got his own message, um, but definitely a lot of his mega proxies have on the Hill. Yeah, no, it, uh, we're talking at a time when uh, Bob Woodward's <laughs> audio book of the tapes just right. came out. Like, yeah, he never stopped talking to anybody from the kind of. You know, older generation, Woodward, all the way on mm -hmm. down from the Post to the Times to CNN. He would, he would talk to everybody. So what's, what do you think is the difference in terms of strategy or in terms of this generation or, or those who aren't Trump in terms of the, yeah. the difference? The, the difference fundamentally, Pete, is that Trump grew up in the mainstream media. He grew up revering the New York Times, wanting to be on CNN, became close to uh to titans of the media world. And uh, so for Trump, even as he, he has, you know, rattled his saber at them, he still has a, a, an acute understanding of and relationships with members of the media. Whereas a Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, a Paul Gosar, the right wing congressman from Arizona, who also figures in heavily in my book, Matt Gates, Lauren Boebert, on down the line, um, they haven't ever spoken to members of the mainstream media. They take at face value that we are all habitual liars because, after all, look at how we defamed Trump regarding Russia. And, and meanwhile, they have propaganda outlets that are so much easier to deal with. And yeah. by this, I mean One America News, Newsmax, Real America Voice, Breitbart, Gateway Pundit, um, who will just, you know, credulously 
um, as stenographers print up anything that these guys have to say that they never really have to face tough questions. And so um, to them, a tough question, a challenging story uh, or a challenging reporter um, is on its face fake news because it just feels like a harder experience. Right, right. And we can go way back to where, you know, that that began if we wanted to. But let's stick with the time frame, you know, Rush Limbaugh and drive by media and all that just constantly disparaging. Newt Gingrich did it to me. It's my mm-hmm. face. I was like, dude, I'm a mm-hmm. comedian hosting a public interest show. Like, I'm not uh, your enemy. Like, I was at serious when I was at uh, serious exam. But uh, let's get back to January 6. Um, man, do you talk to a lot of people and tell a lot of stories that I, I never knew. I can't put this book down and I pay attention to this stuff minute to minute, day to day. And have talked to so many authors who have written about it, but this is definitely different. W- let, let's start with January 6th and, and you can pick any one of the characters, the people that you interviewed that were players. You mentioned Gozar where the book opens. What, what about this guy? What do we need to know? Yeah, Gosar, well, so you mentioned the Tea Party book. Gosar came in on the Tea Party wave in 2010. Pete, I interviewed him in early 2011, and I thought, boy, here's a forgettable person who will probably fade from view in a term or two. <laughs> He's managed to stick around in, in large part because he has appealed to the rightmost flank of the very conservative district that he inhabits. Um, was still a fairly minor character on the Hill until um, the November 2020 election. And Gosar uh, hosted the first Stop the Steal rally in downtown Phoenix. And then later, more and more of these uh, began to grow and influence himself. Uh, Then with Senator Ted Cruz objected to the certification of the state of Arizona, which led uh, into uh, the internal debates on the Hill that were interrupted by the riot. So, Gosar is part of you know uh, of the January sixth that I that I chronicle, but but also what I tried to do in the book was to reconstruct the experiences of that day first from the Republicans and Democrats who were there, um, and then to um, other people like myself who also was there uh, and was interfacing with Capitol police officers as they were being beaten and maced by the rioters, and then finally once I managed to get outside and be among uh, the mob to um, faithfully record as best as I could uh, some of my impressions about being in their company. And so in a way, what I try to do is, is put together what's very much much a Rashomon kind of day where so many different people have, have different accounts because um, there was so much going on. But, uh, but you know, it's, um, it's truly a day that will live in infamy, a day really worth memorializing. And so I, I spend a considerable number of pages just focusing on that one day in Washington. I wonder if there's anything you also wrote about uh, foreign conflicts, specifically a great book about Bush's war in Iraq. And there just seems to be no parallel to January 6th and that every other controversy, every other war, every other, quote, scandal or non-scandal or whatever you want to call it. It was Congress doing some kind of investigation or oversight into the thing. In this case, they're doing an investigation and they're talking about a, a, an event that they were central to, that they were at, they were in the room of all the people that you talked to, Republican or Democrat. Was any, did anybody tell you I was, I was, you know, not too worried. It was fun because after it, a lot of them played it down, but did anybody say, and you were there uh, that during it, it was no, they weren't that, they weren't that concerned as they hid under their desks and and in bathrooms in a stall at one point, one Congressman, as you wrote, sitting on a, on a toilet. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. And, and others barricaded in their offices or in hideaways, uh, others who very much fear for their life. And Marjorie Taylor Greene, by the way, you know, is one who I am convinced, you know, um, uh, did not see coming the violence at the Capitol, though perhaps she should have realized how she was egging on the rioters um, and herself felt very, very um, upset and threatened that day. But there were others who did not. I, I mentioned in the book that uh Paul Gosar, uh, his chief of staff, was contacted by uh, a Republican friend, uh, you know, just to express concern over his well-being. And Gosar's chief of staff said, no, no, we're fine over here. Those are our people. So, you know, there were there were Republicans who actually did believe, no, 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 we're you know, they're not coming after us. Um, But there were other Republicans who were the belief that, yeah, there is violence there. But because we've been habituated to believe that violence only comes from the left, it must be that our people who were there to protest peacefully were stirred up or agitated somehow by Antifa. And of course, later, this migrated over to an even more insidious 
notion that the FBI had somehow staged the whole thing. So, um, but in real time, there were certain people who feared a great deal, certain people who are quite lack- lackadaisical about it. But I tell you, for staff members, uh, you know, left and right of the dial, uh, Democrats and Republicans who were barricaded in their office, young people who had never signed on to anything, you know, like this. Um, it was a truly, truly terrifying moment. Anybody that you talk to truly believe in all good faith that those folks weren't Trump supporters or supporters somehow of, of their cause that didn't believe the election, you know, that, that all of the, the big lie and all of it, because I, I feel like it's easy in retrospect to at this point, create any, any kind of conspiracy theory, crisis actors, all that they can they can get away with that and pass it off. But I mean, one thing is they've prosecuted hundreds of people who there's tons of evidence of who they are and the life they lived and why they were there. It has all come out in their trial. Does anybody actually believe that those were not Trump supporters or that they were even worse Antifa or something like that? Well, again, it depends on who you talk to. There are certainly people, say, who weren't at the Capitol that day, rank and file Republicans. One of them called me the other day, a woman in Texas who is a party official who just insisted to me that uh, January the 6th, where she had friends um, show up, uh, was a peaceful protest. But then suddenly she swerved and said, actually, you know, the whole thing was staged by Pelosi and the FBI. And she swerved again and said Antifa, you know, did the whole thing. Um, there are also, you know, and, and, and then, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene believes that, okay, certain bad things happen, but we still believe Antifa had some responsibility for it. And we also believe that uh, the people who did protest peacefully, even if a few of them got out of hand, that they are now being politically persecuted and languishing, you know, in the bowels of the D.C. jail. And that there's a two tier system of government as a result, one for Trump supporters and one for the for everybody else. Mm-hmm. And, and so, yeah, I mean, all of these myths have taken hold. And the reason they take hold, Pete, is because when you live in a bubble and this is and you are surrounded, the, the only news you consume is blaring this kind of uh, disinformation. And the only people you know believe this stuff too. And your own elected officials are spouting this stuff into their social media megaphones. Then, you know, it's hard to get out from under all of that disinformation and say, wait a minute, I do wonder if I should reach um, for a second opinion. That, That just tends not to be a human tendency. So well said. I mean, you do have a lot of almost like psychological analysis or conjecture of it just by in your writing and covering this. It leads the reader to think, oh, my gosh, what's what's this person's angle? What's their psychology? What's their background? And you give us a lot of background on these people and 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 the players. I think that probably the most interesting thing is what's about to happen. And in your book, you, you, you have a lot of evidence, I think, of what's about to happen. Anything could change. But basically, we talk about the changing of the guard in the Republican House from Ryan to McCarthy, who you write about. It's fascinating to potentially Marjorie Taylor Greene. People are actually saying that. And, and it's a fascinating thing. What might come if they take over? And I, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about your conversations with Kevin McCarthy um, and your understanding of this guy, because you have just an amazing profile of who this man really is and where he's been on the record. Yeah, to be clear, Pete, I've spent a lot of time over the years talking to Kevin McCarthy. Um, He didn't cooperate with this book. I think it was his considered judgment that uh, in his um, single minded efforts to win back the House of Representatives, um, uh, he's uh, he's not going to say anything that could constitute um, it could do him harm in that. However, I spent a lot of time talking to people who know him well. And so I think I got more than my money's worth and, and have a long understanding of McCarthy anyway. And in the thumbnail sketch of that understanding, Pete, is that this is a guy who um, uh, uh, doesn't have much of an ideology. <laughs> he um, he wants power. He wants to be the Speaker of the House, uh, putting him in the succession for that matter to be president of the United States. And uh, he knows that to gain that power, uh, he needs the support of the base of the Republican Party. That base of the Republican Party is beholden to Donald Trump. McCarthy has made that determination, has made the determination that he can't succeed without the support of Trump or without the support of Trump's proxies on the Hill, foremost among them Marjorie Taylor Greene. So what that has meant in the immediate is that he has kept her close, he has kept Trump close, uh, he has assisted Trump in his um, uh, in giving him advice about who to endorse for congressional candidates. Uh, and he has put Marjorie Taylor Greene 
um, literally as well as figuratively in the room during policy discussions. He's promised her plum committee assignments after she was stripped summarily of the committee assignments that she did have by uh, the democratically controlled House um, in early 2021. And uh, meanwhile, um, Donald Trump has been talking to Marjorie Greene about uh, her potentially being his running running mate. Now, I don't know if that's going to happen. And I don't know if he's had this conversation with a half a dozen other people. But it does go to show you like how consolidated the MAGA power has become and how beholden Kevin McCarthy is to that. Yeah. And frankly, how enabling you know, he is of, of you know, the MAGA movement. You have done a whole bunch of great interviews for this amazing new book that's out. I've watched several of them. So I like to, at this point, uh, in the pecking order, give my uh, talented author guest the opportunity to talk about some part of your new book that Weapons of Mass Delusion that you haven't been asked about. There are uh, how many parts, how many chapters, how many pages, each one so good. I'm enthralled with it. Almost 400 pages. And so what have you not been asked about that uh, that you'd like to mention as a way to talk about what you know, what else we learn and what kind of things we can learn with your access and experience in this new book? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Pete. I think that, the, you know, the 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 most important part of the book is the part that's least talked about, which so the weapons of mass delusion, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, their enablers like Kevin McCarthy, that understandably has received a lot of attention because these are well-known people. Yeah. But um, the people who've fallen prey to, to delusion en masse, uh, the tens of millions of Republican voters, are the people I think that constitute the greatest threat to American democracy. And I say that just as an observation, not as a human judgment. Um, again, these are people who live in an ecosystem where they have heard these lies over and over and have digested them whole. And I did a lot of interviews um, in the book and experienced um, firsthand. And I remember actually before I got the book contract, a few months before, uh, I went to a sentencing hearing in a federal courtroom in Utah, a guy named Scott Haven, who was a Mormon, you know, seemed like a good, solid citizen, a health insurance salesman. But over the course of two years, he had placed nearly 4,000 threatening phone calls to Democratic members of Congress, threatening to blow their heads up, talking about hanging them. And ultimately, um, uh, he was arrested. And um, and in the sentencing hearing, as the prosecutor recited all of the things that he had said, and he had pled guilty to them, he was repeating over and over, just murmuring to himself, this wasn't me, this wasn't me. And it was as if he, you know, was, had suddenly come to life and realized he'd been, you know, in a way body snatched uh, mm -hmm. by the conservative talk radio host Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity, whose who's, uh, shows he'd become addicted to. Yeah. And he was just spouting their talking points and finally living and breathing their talking points. And it had disfigured him as a human being while he in turn demonized Democrats and believed that they weren't human beings. Yeah. And so there was a really striking moment where I saw how delusion can manifest itself in a person. But uh, but Scott Haven is just one of tens of millions of people. And of course, his comeuppance was, you know, he committed crimes and he had to be jailed for them and ultimately then probation. Um, and uh, and we see that as well with, as you mentioned before, I mean, 800 people who've been in, indicted for uh, January 6th related offenses, so many of whom you can see in their social media were absolutely under the delusion, not just that the, the, the 2020 election was stolen, but that America, that they knew it was coming to an end absent a real revolution, an yeah. armed revolution on their part. Well, yeah, it's really the most important thing. I agree with with that about your book. But just to be a little bit more clear, you started by saying this is not a judgment that I'm saying that these people are yeah. against democracy or that they're the greatest threat to de de democracy. What you're just to elaborate on that, because you write about it, you talk to these people. And they are against democracy. Now, you yeah. can't get Republican, maybe uh, commentators, the most influential one, much, much less representatives to generally admit that. And maybe you can. But what you're saying here is as a reporter, I talk to these people. They tell me they want a different system, that they don't like this system. And, and, and tell right. me, elaborate a little bit more on that. Sure. Well, well, so it proceeds from this, Pete. If you feel like democracy hasn't worked out for you. And in particular, if you feel that your vote was stolen away from you and sure. your president was deprived victory, if you truly believe that yeah. and you are surrounded you know, within an ecosystem that pumps out this disinformation, then then you basically believe democracy is a joke and it's been weaponized against me. So, you know, during my reporting, I would actually hear 
you know, voter after voter, conservative after conservative say, we're not a we're not a democracy anyway. We're a republic. And when I ask them, like, OK, that's like a fine academic point maybe you're making or something. But, but yeah. uh, what do you really mean by this? And they and what they would tell me is, well, that to them. Democracy means mob rule. Democracy means if you somehow manage to get 50 percent plus one vote, then you can upend, you can take away my property, you can take away everything I've got. Of course, that is not what happens in our democracy. And in any event, we were never an Athenian democracy style democracy where, you know, the, uh, everybody gathers in a public you know, square and votes, you know, I or nay on something. We're, we're a representative form of democracy. But um, and uh, look, I think it's perilous for the state of our country, that so many people have become anti-democratic, who, um, uh, who uh, you know, seem tolerant or even embracing of authoritarian impulses. But I do think that, um, you know, th- this has been a migration over time that, that somehow democracy represents loss to them. It represents it, forfeiture. It, and, uh, and, and the 2020 election is is both the crowning example of it and also a metaphor for a deeper sense of grievance and loss that they feel. One interesting point as you're talking, I'm thinking about how I've been listening to right wing talk radio for most of my career. I used to share an office with those guys at Sirius. Mm-hmm. And I've also been listening to presidential speeches and like growing up, every president talked about spreading democracy throughout the world. So you can talk about the fine point between representative democracy and, you know, that, that but that's a that's a, ra- a talk radio talking point. I mean, you only have to go to every president ever said we're we want to spread democracy. And that's what wars right. were fought over. And then they're like, we're not a democracy. And it, it, you know, if you confront them with Reagan or Bush's speech as anybody's, I wonder I wonder how they take that. They just have a seemingly lack of understanding. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, they certainly um, in their reckoning of America as the great country in the world have forgotten that America is great because America is good or perceived as good. Right. It's perceived as good because it's a model of democracy as messy as that can be, you know, as problematic as it sometimes is and as flawed um, as our our democratic procedure is. It's still is, you know, the, the country that is considered, you know, the beacon. Uh, when it comes to uh, democratic institutions, and I and I think that people have lost faith of that. They think instead we're prosperous and and uh, um, you know we have freedom of speech or something like that. But they fail to recognize how we really are role model to the country, and not you know. So that added to my um, chagrin and really even trauma when I you know surfaced from January the sixth and was coming home from the Capitol and was getting texts from across the world from friends of mine in other countries. Who were saying, I can't believe what I just saw on TV. I can't believe this happened in America. And uh, and to me, that was really moving and 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 put in context the importance of America to countries that may not always express admiration uh, outwardly for the U.S., but in their bones depend on America as uh, as a fount of democracy. And to see that that pillar shudder um, was traumatizing for them as well. Robert, I so appreciate you joining me today. I more appreciate your your whole career. You've you've written several books and so many great articles over the year. I was going through my correspondence. I talked to you a few times when I was at SiriusXM, and and yeah. I've always been a big fan and supporter of your work. And I do think, and I'm not just, I mean, I've been kissing your ass a lot, I think, but you do it more when you host a podcast from a shed and you're talking to a Robert Draper type. But Weapons of Mass Delusion, I really got to say, it's it's essential reading to understand what's going on and on the right in America and, and what it means for you. I, I you, You've done a really, really, this is a very good book. Thank you so much for talking to me about it. It's truly my pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Pete. Well, there you go, Robert Draper, everybody. And yeah, there was, there was a lot of ass kissing, but I think he deserved it. I thought that's a, a great book. He's a great writer. And I really need you to go let him know that you heard him here on the show because he writes these great long form articles in the New York Times magazine that I always want to get him on for. So let him know that you heard him here, that this is a place that he is welcome at Draper Robert on Twitter. If you're still on Twitter, lots to talk about that. Elon Musk officially buying it. And uh, I'm still trying to wrap my head around that and see what happens day to day, hour to hour with that platform, which is so important for so many reasons. We talked about that last night. Hang out, too. Anyway, at Draper Robert, at Draper Robert. Go say hello to him. Go follow him. Go let him know that you heard him here on at Stand Up With Pete. If you're not following that handle, please do that as well. Okay. All right. Now time to get to 
Christian Finnegan, who joins me pretty much every Friday, often with Ophira Eisenberg, who couldn't join us this weekend, but he is one of my favorite comedians, one of my favorite thinkers. I always love the way that he frames things in his own unique, original way. Of course, a stand-up comedian, writer, actor based in New York City, where his wife owns this great venue, QED, that he often references. His wife, Cambry Cruz, who's also been on the show. Follow him on Twitter. Say hello to Christian at Christ Finnegan, everybody. And his website is ChristianFinnegan.com. You want to learn more by his albums. And uh, I, that, I guess that's all I want to say here at the opening. Let's get to it. My latest conversation with the great Christian Finnegan, everybody. I'm very happy to, to have you joining me. I've had to make do with my Pete Dominic body pillow. Oh, really? You got one of those? Thank you. Mm-hmm. Now, the money went for that. Went to a pretty good cause. Me. Yeah. <laughs> myself i mean i might have to buy another one now because this one's kind of stained yeah i wish people would be more honest when they're when they're selling stuff i mean i think it'd be probably that way when they're selling their album or something but yeah money goes to good it goes right to me all of it to the me I th- yeah i think comedians a lot of comedians have a you know have a bit about that when they're selling their merch at the end of the stage like this goes to a very good cause weed or something you know something stupid like right that. sure fair enough uh, um, so how have things been? You've been the past few weeks, you've been, you've been doing some gigs. You were in DC at the improv, which is one of my favorite clubs. You, I you, was. They love you there. How did that go? It was fun. I had a couple, couple of, uh, listeners that came out to the oh, show, which I, was nice. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. They, uh, introduced themselves after the shows. They were both very nice people and, um, it was good. I mean, I, it's, I'm in a weird place where it's like, I haven't been doing a lot, a ton of road work. So it was, I was just happy to have the long sets. Like I haven't been able to do 45, 50 minutes as much recently. And so that was fun. But like, you know, as a comedian, just comic to comic, I, I feel like I'm in that place where I am happy with half the set and the other half is either old and I'm sick of doing it or too new to, you know, be totally thrilled with the other. So it's like in... But in a way, that's kind of like the most exciting part of the process sure. when you're not, you know, it's it's not the most gratifying in terms of just audience response. But when you're kind of in the weeds, like, all right, well, this bit is sort of working and this bit could be longer or this bit could be shorter. Um, but, yeah, it just kind of whets my appetite and wish I was I, makes me want to get out on the road more. It's just hard with uh, life stuff. I also uh, can you just tell me just to give the update on this perspective of where live performance is at in your opinion in, in in this era of COVID? Now, did you hear about the triple demic? By the way, COVID flu and RSV. It's going to affect young children even more already is apparently. But like COVID is is not gone. But I feel like that's part of the question here, which is: Will live performance ever be back? Does it ever feel like it's like like it was before the pandemic? No, I mean you know there are plenty of shows that you know I've gone to either you know that i've been on or that have been in my wife's venue or whatever that have been completely sold out and whatnot but i do think that there is a veneer or you know not veneer is not even the right word there is a section maybe 15 to 25 percent of people who were going out to shows three years ago that aren't going out to shows right now and uh unfortunately a lot of those people are audience members i like a lot you know they yeah i mean some of the some of the covid zero people are a little maybe a little through the looking glass with this stuff at this point like maybe maybe uh like you can't be expecting people to not be going out right now there's a certain group of people who you know you'll still see the sort of online scolding like how dare you not how how dare you be outside yeah. living your life right now when there's still COVID. And I understand where that comes from, but it's not really realistic for a lot of people. Yeah, no, who I, need I, to I'm one of those people. I even say it when, and when I do perform, I'm like, why are you guys out? I wouldn't have come out <laughs> to see me. Yeah. But I mean, so, so it's like, I don't think it's back where it was. I'm sure for some performers or some comics, yeah, it is where it was because their audiences are the kind of audiences who don't give a crap. <laughs> Um, but I feel like, especially in a place like DC, which is usually yeah. a city where I have at least a couple sellouts, I didn't have any. Now, is that because of COVID or is that just because I haven't been on TV in the past two or three years? You, you know what I mean? So it's like, who's to say? But I do think that there is a, a small section of people who 
are still not out yet. And unfortunately, a lot of the people who aren't out yet are the, some of the people I really like performing for the most because they're the people who might be a little more uh, in, inclined for not to say intellectual comedy because God knows I don't do that. But that just are, are maybe not quite. They don't they're not the show us your tits people. But got it. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. No, I think that's absolutely right of you and, and, and your brand and what you you do on stage that there's a certain sensitivity or a thoughtfulness where they might be is without even judgment of the people who aren't, but like on the, on the spectrum of a little bit more careful about wanting to go out and be around a lot of people in this time. And it could be for any number of good reasons and hard to blame anybody. Yeah, at this point. I mean, there's like, I'm not an NPR comedian by any means. Like I'm a comedy club comic, but I do like performing for an NPR adjacent crowd. Sure. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Sure. That is like, I wish I had more of those people in my audience. I also um, think there, those are the people who generally aren't going out a lot right now. There's a certain sympathy, at least I have. I think, I don't know, somebody had an article, maybe it was in New York Times, about the people who are like permanently just not going out. You know, young yeah. people with the young young kids or something or whoever it is, older folks, whatever. They're just, people they're, have learned. They've learned how to live without live entertainment and, you know, they've learned how to adjust and adapt and uh, you know, as I've said a thousand times, uh, you know, with regards to New York City specifically, it's going to take that crop of kids who are currently in high school and college for them to move to New York for the city to get back to normal. Mm. Because the adults who live here now are always going to have that PTSD of living through COVID here, especially in Astoria, Queens, where I live, which was like the epicenter of the yeah. epicenter. And you know, it's going to it's going to be a few years. I think you're going to have to have a bunch of horny 22 year olds moving to New York who just aren't going to stay home. Like that's what it's going to take to sort of refresh the sort of live entertainment. Do you think I mean, you're audience. talking about New York, but I mean, it's probably true, at least of live entertainment aspect. Yeah, I, th I think that you can extrapolate that to yeah. to everywhere that it's it's going to be that crop of teenagers who come into adulthood and just want to be outside and want to be with people and want to socialize because there's just a lot of 35 year olds who have learned how yeah. to not go out. The question for listeners, do you, have you changed even your social behavior? Do you still go out with that couple? Do you have even a couple to go out with? Some people don't not judging. Uh, do you go out to live entertainment? Do you, are you still in that bowling league? Wh whatever it might be, you know, we do our Thursday night hangouts, which you're always welcome to join. And I literally have as much fun. I stay for three hours. It's like, certainly part of this gig and my job and everything I'm doing and people love it, but I love it. Like I find it to be very satisfying in terms of social. There's like 50 people there and we have a great time. And I, it's definitely replaced going to a place and having several people. I'm happy. I'm comfortable, whatever. Yeah. I mean, I, I understand that, but it terrifies me. It, it really does terrify me. Yeah. In what terms do you worry of, about? Yeah. What parts the, of it? Well, it just, again, what it for, means. for my chosen field and not oh, yeah. even on my own behalf. Cause you know, my career is, one leg in the grave anyway, but I'm saying, uh, in terms of just, I still love the arts. You know, I, I, I love theater. I love live music. I, you know, I enjoy going to dance concerts. Like I, I really am terrified of the end of happy hour and the end of social yeah. gatherings, Yeah, you know, that so much of the people that will come out to shows, it's like, Hey, we'll go out for a beer after work and then we'll go to a show or, you know, we'll have dinner and then we'll head over to see a play or whatever. And if that all moves online, cause everybody's working from home and like it, it really, you know, it's a, I don't blame anybody. Right. I totally blame. Uh, I, I totally understand that that is the way the culture has moved and even without COVID, just the availability of technology. I understand that, but man, it really, it really makes me sad. I was literally about to say, well, who do you blame? Christian. And then you, you, you got ahead of me. You're like, I don't blame anybody. And it was not, it's not <laughs> as fun. Who do you blame for the pandemic and everything well, that's I mean, happened? These, these hangouts you have, Pete, you realize that every time you have a hangout, you're preventing those people from spending money on live entertainment. So I do blame yeah, you. Yeah, for sure. Level. But they're spending money on their subscription to me. So on the end, I'm, I only care about me. Yeah. All okay. right. And I, you it know, I do it on shows. What? It shows. And and I do it on Thursdays. <laughs> Not like I'm taking your Friday or Saturday audience. <laughs> no, I get it. I but get I it. will. There is a video that you shared that I don't, I shouldn't bring it up because it's hard to describe, but
But I just have to say, it's one of the funnier things I've seen, and I left it up on my screen, and it just keeps re, you know, going and going. And it's the Ohio State or the the college football game, and there's a boy on the sidelines ringing the bell, but he's standing behind the bell, and it looks like he's jerking off furiously, furiously, yeah. and. I just want people to go to your Twitter timeline for that. It is one of the funniest things I have seen. You've been tweeting a lot of funny <laughs> little videos lately at your Twitter I mean, timeline. I'm retweeting. I, I'm just it's. I'm just a human, Pete. I'm not. I'm not a hero. I'm just a. Oh, I just love a man. Your, I love what you share. I love your discernment. That's why I love your music newsletter. I like your thoughts on things. That's why I have you on here. So I think that's true of people's Twitter. Like I like to go see what you're finding, what you think is funny. I like that about your. Thank you. I appreciate Twitter that. timeline for sure. Everything that you write, ex- except for like when I don't understand it because it's too above my head, which happens sometimes. Well, that's always you know the challenge sometimes. Like you, you want you don't want to spoon feed, right? You know, you don't want, it's like with the joke. It's like, you don't want to be, want it to be too obvious. Have you ever heard those, uh, on comedy albums where they, you know, there's like a series of eighties, uh, cassettes or albums where it was like long form interviews with comedians. And there's one with Seinfeld and I, you know, I've fallen out of love with Seinfeld in the past 10 years, but I still, in terms of talking about the craft of stand up, there's probably nobody who's put more thought into it. And he talks about it, how it's like, you want the jump to be just far enough that the audience makes it. Do you know what I mean? That like you want the the yes. gap that they have to jump over yes. to be, to be far enough that it's, yeah. it's a difficult jump, but that they actually do make it. And so it's like with, with the joke, it's like you want to leave enough out there that people can kind of, well, almost do have to work themselves of like getting it. I totally agree with that, except for the problem where sometimes you need more context. And I just explained somebody yeah. else's really good joke on Twitter. And I knew I was doing it. But I thought it was worth it because not everybody, you know, in the political Twitter or news Twitter, everybody just assumes that everybody has heard or seen that this thing happened. And there's a very inside baseball, to, as far as I could tell, when, you know, in the Pennsylvania Senate debate, Doc Oz said something about abortion. It should be between you, your doctor and your local politicians. So very funny guy who I follow, Sam Youngman, tweeted, OK, so we voted to fix that dang pothole on Elm up next in the city's council agenda. Should Jennifer, Jennifer survivor ectopic pregnancy? I felt the need to quote his tweet and explain what he was talking about, which was Dr. Oz wants you to leave your health care decisions to you, your doctor and your local politicians. I can't wait for those city council meetings. I literally explained this guy's joke. I did it. There's that's the debate. That's the internal debate you have, because yeah. it's like it does weaken the joke for the people who do already know the context. All right. You know it. But but for the people who don't need, you know, and that's that's the that's the eternal struggle. That's that's my struggle. I think. Well, Isn't that I, what Hitler called it. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> Speaking of <laughs> anti-Semitism, uh, what do you think of what the response to Kanye's repeated comments overtly horrible about jewish folks uh what do you think of the response that all these corporate sponsors have ended with him i guess spotify is still carrying his music what do you think of this response overall i mean you know there's a small group of people for whom this will confirm their anti-semitism you know like oh see when you speak out against the jews this is what happens to you yep but the fact is is like Nobody's under any legal responsibility to carry anyone's music or to be partnered with somebody. You know, if, if you if you're telling like if you insult me to my face and you insult my family and my you know my my religion and my people, it's like I'm under no you know. And it, honestly, them dropping him kind of contradicts the cliche that they're leaning on. It's like oh, they control everything and they're you know the about the money and the you know and the media and all that. It's like well, clearly if I'm you know, losing money by not working with you. Well, that sort of works against that narrative slightly. I, I'm, I'm speaking out my ass a little bit here, but I, I mean, I, I just, I'm so sick of hearing about Kanye West. I don't understand. I mean, his genius. I, I've never really bought into him being a musical genius. I, oh, really? there's, there's a couple of, of Kanye albums that I quite like. I think my, my dark twisted fantasy is really good. And I like a lot of, uh, 
whatever the one with the uh, black skin head and you know there's a there's there's probably seven or eight kanye west songs that i think are genuinely great okay but his genius to the extent that he has genius is in manipulating attention you know and that's mm. always been the case and it's been really weird to watch people over the past five or six years continue to sort of just like oh my god the new kanye west album is dropping like to have this media because i always want to be like Name one song off his last album that you cared. Like, I feel like it's, he's, he's released like five or six albums since he put out any music that anyone is going to remember six months after it came out. You, mm. you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's really kind of more of a sideshow than anything. And so, I mean, I'm glad to see everybody finally kind of giving him his comeuppance. But I kind of always wondered, I've always been wondering, I was like, wh- why didn't, why didn't you do this? Five years ago, you know, or a few years ago when he talked about how, like, you know, b- black people were like addicted to slavery or slavery some, some of the was a choice. Things. Huh? I think he, one of the things was slavery was a choice. Yeah, slavery was a choice. That's yeah. right. Yeah. You know, and it's just I, I think a lot of times people mistake someone being opinionated with someone being insightful. That someone who talks a lot, you know, there's a James Brown song, uh, talking loud and saying nothing. You know, which is to me, Kanye West in a nutshell. It's like mm. a lot of these people, they're just so impressed when a celebrity has has any thoughts. <laughs> it's like with the same thing with Kyrie yeah. Irving. It's like, oh, wow, you know, you have an opinion about the Illuminati. That must mean you're intelligent. It's like, no, it's like th- th- we're, we're as a culture, we're obsessed with people who've read five books. Yeah. Aaron Rodgers is the best example. He's oh, read, exactly. Aaron he, Rodgers he is read a uh, Ayn Rand or something. And then went you know, on with all the big podcasters. Yeah. I mean, that's, and so, you know, I, I'm, I have no problem with, with him being uh deplatformed or, you know, quote unquote canceled or whatever. I, I do not give a shit. And I don't think we're losing a whole lot. What about, <laughs> culturally, frankly, what about, I'm asking you now to be on Budsman and criticize me. What about, should I be deplatformed for the sin that I committed this week? compromising my credibility, spreading misinformation when uh, the campaign spokesman or not campaign spokesman, one of the communications people on Charlie Chris campaign sent me a video saying that DeSantis people were chanting refried beans at Carla Hernandez, who's my friend who I just interviewed. And then he asked me to share it on Twitter to, to boost it. And I said, sure. And I shared it. I said, this is horrible. Turns out they weren't chanting refried beans. They were chanting, keep Florida free. And I got called out rightfully. So I deleted my, Tweet, I apologized and said I only had one source, but it was on the scene. I I thought this was right and I I'm I was wrong. Then I had to delete that tweet because the dog pile was so bad. Um what's wrong what's wrong with people like me? Um Well, I mean it is very instructive to sort of the the landmines we're surrounded by that we are encouraged to express ourselves in the most strident, passionate ways. But we're expected to do it with lightning fast speed and with the least amount of consideration beforehand. Do do you know what I mean? That it's like Twitter, you know, social media, it catches us in our most carefree private moments, Hmm. but then it's broadcast to the world. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, I guarantee you that if someone asked you to get up on stage and talk about this uh, refried beans thing, bef- you know, before you found out that it was false, you would have probably done more research on like, I'm not going to get in front of, I'm not going to stand up in front of a group of people and say right. some bullshit that I don't know whether it's true on the, like on the I'm, radio, on TV. Yeah. Yeah. You would be in, yeah, you would be instinctively suspicious of yeah. it. And yep. wary of it in a way that we yeah, aren't on right. our social media feeds. We just mm. sort of launch shit into the void because mm. it feels oh, I'm fucking sitting on my couch or I'm sitting on the shitter or whatever. You know, it doesn't feel like we're on some sort of soapbox or behind a podium, but we are. And so to me, it's 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 an instructive, but it's also sadly instructive in another way, too, in that, you know, your your reward for acknowledging your being wrong was what death threats mostly yeah <laughs> yeah you know and that's the thing that the the right has understood or whatever is like no just just double down or just don't if at the very least just don't talk about it but never apologize never admit you were wrong just just deny 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 
and you know, cause there is no reward for saying, Hey, I fucked up. Uh, that's the sad truth. One person did accurately call me a soy boy beta cuck libtard. Now I do identify as all of those. So yeah, not I mean, wrong. Who cares? I, I, yeah, I mean, sure. What, what, I, I don't, those words are so utterly meaningless to me. Like those <laughs> terms, you know, and yeah, I'm always going to identify more with the, I don't, you know, I'm, I break everything down into sort of drama, ki- drama club kids versus jocks. <laughs> it's like, like I am obsessed with basketball. Like I spend probably more time thinking about the New York Knicks than I do my own career, but I'm always going to, I'm always going to be on the side of the artsy fartsy kids and not the basketball team. Right. <laughs> you know, like when it comes to like sure. the people I associate with and sure. the people who I care about. Um, and so to me, this whole soy boy, libtard, whatever, it's just that high school di- dynamic playing out over again. And as I think, I, I think I've said on this podcast in the past, that everybody always uses the term jocks versus nerds. And I don't think it's ever been jocks versus nerds. I think it's jocks versus artists in the nerds are a swing group. I don't think I have heard you say that. <laughs> it's, it's jocks versus the kids in the art class and in the school play and in the band. That's the rivalry and nerds can go either way. Nerds can, you know, th- at certain points they're on more on the liberal side, you know, and on certain points they'll team up with the jocks because they think that they'll be part of the in crowd. I love that. That is a fascinating analysis. It I mean, is... you look at you look at Elon Musk as being like the perfect example of that. You know, this guy who in the Obama years, you know, sort of identified as vaguely liberal, primarily just because the term electric car was in connection with his name and because tech at the time was sort of Obama aligned. But then the minute he started getting love more from conservatives and, you know, sort of jock assholes, that's where he went because Generally speaking, the nerds are low in emotional intelligence and they'll go where the love is. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Sorry. Now, now who's the real bully? Oh, I am. That is amazing analysis, which I think everybody listening can identify with somehow and sounds. And, and if, the, if you're offended by that, uh, I will only say, don't worry. You're not actually a nerd. You just ah. are blaming yourself <laughs> a nerd because you think that's cool now. <laughs> all right man i thank you so much for yeah i love talking to you that was great really really good and i will uh, hopefully we'll talk next week maybe ophira will be back uh, but i uh, i appreciate this. this is great as always thanks buddy all right there he goes christian better get on twitter at christ finnegan go let him know that you're glad he's back if you're glad he's back let him know you're glad he's back at christ finnegan on twitter and that's all i've got for you today Please go reach out to uh, Robert Draper at Draper Robert on Twitter as well. Go get his new book, Weapons of Mass Delusion. And that's it. I think that's all I've got. You know, I want to plug more things. I want you to go to the YouTube.com slash Stand Up With Pete and watch uh, videos there, what we're posting. Thank you to Barry Hummel, Tina Winsett, and Maddie Carlson for another great week of working on that. If you want to join the street team and help promote and produce the show, by all means, join us. You just got to be a subscriber and inquire about it, and we'll get you hooked in. StandUpWithPete at gmail.com is my email address. As always, I hope you have a great weekend. I really appreciate you, and I'm so grateful that you listened to this show. I love you guys. You're the best. Be the change you want to see in the world, and I will talk to you later. John Carroll is going to sing to us now. On your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down, boy, you better stand up. Stand our ground and then
Yeah. 